So you're all very welcome here this morning for a COVID created on a portfolio based assessment, um, kindly funded and supported by the National Forum as part of the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning seminar series. So what I want to just do is welcome you formally on behalf of ePortfolio Ireland. And uh, ePortfolio Ireland consists of a, a, a large community of practice or a professional network around the use of ePortfolio and research into ePortfolio practice. So there is myself and Karen Buckley, and we have Orna here and Tom as well. Um, from IT Tralee, myself and Orna are from DCU and we formed the, the steering committee of ePortfolio Ireland. So on behalf of all of us, you're very welcome and you can get more details on ePortfolio Ireland along with some of the resources that we have produced and the events that we have on the email, the web address that is on the screen for you right now. Um, I just want to very briefly play this uh, on behalf of the National Forum. So if you just sit back and relax, we'll just get started. <music> Sorry, <laughs> that was me trying to multitask. Thank you to the National Forum and if you are tweeting about today's events and I hope you do please do use the uh, National Forum seminar hashtag that you can see on screen and what I'd like to do firstly is to welcome our, our featured speakers and thank them for coming along today so Aurelie from UCL and Teresa from uh, well, her, her, just recently retired from the University of Warwick so they're going to be speaking with you uh, in just a few moments so before they do, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background and refer to my colleague Orna Farrell's recent work and give you a bit of a background on the kind of the history of ePortfolio and ePortfolio practice and where we are and where we've come from. So as you can see on screen, Orna, um, Orna goes back to the, the Renaissance Italy to ePortfolio, the concept of ePortfolio going back to, to the, that stage, it's nothing new. Um, so moving forward a number of centuries and moving forward to a different kind of concept of portfolio. If we look at ePortfolios in education, you can see that over the last 20 to 30 years, and um, there has been a movement. So from ePortfolios be being just a fad to becoming an integral part of education, uh, specifically around higher education. So you can see that in the case of 20 years, there's been quite a movement towards the usage of ePortfolio. And even moving forward in time again, back in 2015, which seems like so long ago, well, even 2020 seems so long ago now, um, you can see that Dreisen here stated that ePortfolios or portfolios future seem brighter than ever. And certainly in that kind of more recent time scale, you can see a huge um, momentum behind using portfolios and, and, and talking and researching about ePortfolio practice. In 2011, the, the International Journal for ePortfolio Practice um, was launched. It's, you're beginning to see portfolios used across disciplines and many, many more institutions. And then more recently, um, it was ePortfolio was added by uh, George Koo and the AAC and U to the um, 11 high impact practices. There used to be 10 and now there's 11 and ePortfolio is considered one of those. So around about that time frame, just to give our, our, our own um, community a plug, in 2017, ePortfolio Ireland was formed. 
And that brings us to where we are today. So obviously we have seen, and we are in the midst of a, a huge uh, crisis in uh, a global crisis, which has caused huge impacts across education. 1.4 billion schools were closed over the last year. And just to give you a, a visual depiction of this, assuming my little video watch uh, works, just keep an eye out here for the purple on the screen as this little video plays. So everybody's open, all the schools are open. Look at purple. This is where schools were closed or partially closed. Um, and obviously here in Ireland, we're still in that situation where schools are closed, but universities are open in just an online capacity. So the impact of that was that everybody started from a very, I suppose, um, limited use of e-portfolio. You know, who are in very junior classes, kindergarten or class one. Uh, you know, uh, for well, many of them, the interaction with their friends, with their teachers has been via screen. And you know, now that would be much better if I did that, wouldn't it? Because only one person needs to talk at a time. Um, so where I was going with that was, um, we have traditionally not used e-portfolio a huge amount, our recent survey showed only 16% odd, 17% of higher education institutions uh, used ePortfolio uh, um, across on an, an institution-wide basis. But this crisis has caused us to look for different assessment forms. And every uh, all, all institutions really have been searching for and scrambling for this alternative assessment. Hence, um, a huge increase, certainly that we're seeing within DCU anyway, in the use of ePortfolio. So to talk a little bit more about what is ePortfolio and why you might want to use it, I'm just going to hand over to my uh, friend and colleague, Orna. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, you can advance the slide there. Um, so just a small bit of contextual information, nothing too, nothing too deep. Uh, Lisa's given a, a definition there from Einan and Clark, which is a very good American book on ePortfolio about, they call it a high impact pra practice, but it's a really good book to start off with if, you, if you're trying to get into it. But essentially they say it's a, a medium for recording and showcasing student learning. Uh, and a, a reflection is a huge part of that. I prefer another definition, but that's just me. I like one by a guy called Zub Zarita, which talks about a learning portfolio. I prefer uh, ones that don't focus on the, the E or the tool, because I think it's not really about the, the medium, it's about the message and the process. Um, but there are many, many definitions. Uh, part of my research was to collect those definitions. So I've come across more than 30 different ones over the years. Uh, and I, I find you just have to pick one that you like. Uh, but it, it is a good starting point if you're trying to explain this to students is to, is to tell them what it is because that is a source of confusion uh, and how you're going to use it. So if you want to advance there, Lisa, because the beauty uh, uh, and, and the, the drawback of portfolios is they're very flexible. Um, they can do a lot of different things, but this also causes confusion for both students and staff as to what they're going to use them for. So Lisa's just shown you a few portfolios on screen there. These are some examples of, of student portfolios from our DCU students, some really beautiful ones there, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, and that's a lovely wee video as well. So that's embedded in the slides. I'll put my, uh, Corina, yes, I put my, I'll put my definition into the chat now in a sec for you, no bother. Um, but as I said, I mean, there are so many. You have to choose one that you like. What I find the earlier ones are very technocentric, um, but that's normal. I mean, if you think about it, the curve of development or the curve of evolution, it you know people tend to start off thinking very much about the tool, and then that the understanding evolves. So that there are lovely examples there, Lisa, and that's another really useful way of showing or showing students and even other other colleagues what you mean by portfolio is to show them some. Because again, people aren't really sure. Lisa has a lovely video here uh, created by, or does she have a lovely video? Yes, she does. Uh, <laughs> here created by one of our DCU students talking about their experience creating a portfolio. And again, bringing in that student voice is a very good way of um, 
acclimatizing other students to this process. So, I mean, using a video is very nice. Often I've brought in a previous student or from, a, you know, from a higher year to talk about how they've used it. And, and I often find our, the students' views and perspectives have more currency or more credence with the other students than your own. So do you want to play that, Lisa? I will. And just to stay to say that Iman is here with us today. Oh. So uh, thank you, Iman, for, for doing this. And if you have any questions at all from a, a student perspective, I'm sure Iman would be more than happy to, to uh, take your questions when we get to that point. Hi, my name is Iman and I'm an accounting and finance student in DCU. I had the opportunity to use Loop Reflect for a few of my assignments. And I would love to share my thoughts on using it with you. It was nice to try out a new method of assessment and I really enjoyed it because as an AF student we deal a lot with um, calculations and numbers and so it was nice to try out reflective assessments. This allowed me to analyze an event in my learning journey along with the thoughts and feelings related to it. I really like the fact that the ePortfolio is for life, as this means that I can go back and see the changes in my thinking and learning as I progress through university and even later on in professional life. Lastly, as I'm a very creative and visual person, I really like the fact that you can add in photos and videos and other types of media to make the content that you have in your pages more interactive and engaging. Thanks for listening, and I hope you got an insight into using a learning e-portfolio from a student perspective. Thanks, Iman. So thanks for that. Um, do you want to advance the slide there? And thanks, Iman, for the lovely video. That's a great reusable resource as well. Um, so, so sometimes it's great to do, do a wee video like that that we can keep, keep wheeling out. Um, so delighted to uh, introduce our first speaker now. Uh, Teresa McKinnon coming from the University of Warwick uh, as, an, as a retired associate professor and senior fellow with the HEA and a CMALT learning technologist with ALT. Um, so Teresa is going to introduce herself a little more. Um, so, so Teresa, do you want to take control of the screen and welcome? Thanks. Thanks very much, Shauna and Iman. What a wonderful, I'm, I'm so pleased. I, I couldn't have asked you to say better things because it totally ties up with the purpose really of uh, using an e-portfolio in my practice too. So um, I'm going to share my screen and just take you to my slides. So bear with me a moment while I just do that. And here we go. Okay, so um, as mentioned, I have recently retired, so I'm perhaps the, the only person who's got a good excuse not to be here, but I'd love to come and to uh, spend time with other practitioners, and that's because I am an open educational practitioner. I believe it's very important as a teacher, and I've been a teacher for 35 years, so to actually collaborate both with students and with staff and not just within our institution. And that's the wonder of um, technology really that helps us even in a global pandemic to continue to collaborate and uh, meet together. Um, if you haven't met me online, you will find me on Twitter as at Warwick Language. Uh, and I am very pleasant present online. I'm, I hope I'm reasonably pleasant online, but I'm certainly very present online. Um, and at the end of the uh, slides that I'm going to show you, I will share a blog post with you that will give you an opportunity to um, revisit or to look in more depth at some of the things I'm going to share today. But thanks to Lisa and Orna and everybody who has facilitated this session. It's really great to be spending some time with you. Um, so why and how I came to ePortfolios really was because some years ago in the 2000s, I was tasked as at the time of um, a principal teacher for e-learning um, to help move our language education, because I'm a language educator, um, into a blended format to help students um, and staff connect online. Um, and, and the part of the process of doing that involved um, specking a platform. Uh, we created a, a Moodle platform called Languages at Warwick and I decided at that point that we wanted to incorporate Mahara, an ePortfolio tool. 
And that was because the Moodle platform was all very well, but it's about delivering um, resources, if you like, to students. It's not really a space that you inhabit. It doesn't actually give any benefit to students other than delivering their content and demanding that they submit their assignments. So I wanted something to complement that, a space that students could use as their own. And Mahara was the um, e-portfolio solution that I chose. Um, I think it's really important that we spend time in online environments to really experience how they change our interactions. And we tend to spend time as in visiting online platforms, um, such as we're doing today in Zoom. Um, but if you really live in Zoom, if you take time in Zoom, as COVID has sort of pushed us to do, you become as expert as Lisa has just proven um, in terms of making sure that things run very smoothly, which she just did beautifully. So I believe that actually it's important, not just for students, but for staff to experience um, what it is to be in an online environment and also to master how they um, present themselves through an online environment. So I'm going to quickly um, share with you three examples of um, using an e-portfolio. And this is the first one I'm going to share with you. You may have come across um, before because I have shared this quite extensively over the years. Um, the first thing we decided to do, because a lot of our uh, students are actually not language uh, specialists, they are students who are studying a language in order to, um, in, for their personal development or for their opportunities, if you like, post degree. Um, and the assessment for that language learning was generally 100% language assessed. And what we've decided to do as a team, and this is an international intercultural team of tutors, was to help students focus on the various trans, uh, transversal skills and transferable skills that they would acquire when they learn a language. And to recognize that through a 20% um, assessed e-portfolio. So they would, and I come to back to uh, Iman's comment just now, they would describe their learning journey through an e-portfolio. Um, about 150 students a year for the past eight or nine years have taken part in this. And what I'll show you now are a few screenshots of the sorts of things that they have um, shared with us as their journey. Now you won't be able to read the detail here, but I just want to give you um, some snapshots of the sort of things that they describe about language learning and the tools that they use. So this has been a project that's hugely beneficial for us as tutors. It's helped us to look at um, what tools the students are using, how they're using them, how they find the experience of language learning, and that in turn helps us improve. So it's a really, uh, a very, a very powerful, um, virtuous circle. Um, so you can see here different students have uh, learnt how to um, use the tool in order to present their evidence, to organize it. So at the top here, you can see a block that Ben has pulled in to make it easy for the assessor to quickly find his evidence. They produce evidence of the sort of things they've done and think about how they present that for an assessor. Think about their audience. So in doing this, they learn more about how to um, demonstrate the skills that they have and make them explicit. And that sort of thing is obviously very important when they come to um, getting a job. So in, in that screenshot as well, you can see uh, a themed portfolio. The students at the time had the opportunity to um, choose the colors and the backgrounds as well. So a little bit of creativity is, is available. We have students of Russian, French, German, Japanese, Chinese, as you can see there, all looking at how they tell their story of their journey and how, as Iman mentioned again, uh, creative they can get. So they can share some of their um, use of other tools through their e-portfolio, their assessed e-portfolio. Um, so this is the first, and as I say, the, the most extensive use of e-portfolio that we used whilst I was at Warwick. Um, and a multi-national uh, team involved in that. Um, 
The second use case I want to um, show you is actually um, a these are final year students who are specialists in language. So this was a module um, that I created and ran myself for the past three years. And these were students who, uh, as part of their planning towards leaving university, were thinking they might be interested in education. They might be interested in language teaching. And if you are a linguist, you'll know that we are very desperately short of language teachers. Um, so the aim of this module really was to give them an experience of teaching through technology and to also get them to think about um, learning theories and how they would be affected and how they would interact with learning design through technology. Um, it's actually a very short module. It's just a one term module. Um, so it involves quite a lot of um, opportunities for reflection and um, opportunities for uh, inhabiting different digital spaces, including taking part in a virtual exchange with trainee teachers in Poland. So this group of students experience all sorts of different uses of technology. And the screenshots I'm sharing with you here are from one of those students who really took advantage of the opportunity of an e-portfolio. The, the um, construct here was essentially that they would have a private e-portfolio area, which is true of all Mahara users. Everything that you do within Mahara is private only to you unless you decide to share it. So they used every week um, that some of the... Um, work time, diarising their experiences and their reflections, collecting those over the, over the term, and then selectively incorporating those into an e-portfolio um, view for, um, for assessment. And in this case, it's a, the whole module is 100% assessed. So the e-portfolio was the tool for uh, submitting, not just an essay, because there was an essay content within this, but there was also their reflections and their thoughts on learning um, online and using digital tools for learning. So you can see here, Joe did quite a lot of reflection and visualizing of, of the theories that he'd come across. And that was really nice to see that uh, he was thinking about um, turning his, um, new knowledge about learning design and learning theory into graphics to explain to someone else. So these were really powerful ways of um, taking the content of the course and um, constructing his own reality through that. And I really like this little, well, you can see the huge green arrow here, this little st uh, statement he made. Right at the beginning of the course, we looked at the visitor and residence model um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, around um, use of digital technology. Um, and his conclusion here, residency on an online platform facilitates collaboration. Yeah, because you can join teams and you can work together and autonomy. And these two together, yes, isn't that important? So I can choose what I'm going to do, but I can also work with others and I can choose when and how I work with others. Um, visitors are much less likely to fully engage with the content and therefore will see attainment and performance impacted to a lesser extent. Now, I thought that was a really important moment uh, in Joe's learning because it made him uh, evidence the fact that he was becoming an effective reflective practitioner. And there's only obviously so much you can do in a one term course to prepare somebody for a professional life in teaching, especially one where things are rapidly changing as they are. Um, and this really helped me feel confident that he was going to be an effective reflective practitioner who could make good decisions in the future about how he delivered his teaching. And of course, having he, he's now graduated and having acquired these skills. In fact, Joe found himself uh, um, teaching very, very quickly and very much in demand um, because of his comfort level within online environments. So it's a really nice um, example of how someone's experiences um, help to prepare them for professional life. 
So thirdly, my final example, and if you do follow me on Twitter, I've tweeted a direct link to this, is actually a non-assessed example. Um, but it, it picks up again on something that Iman said, anybody would think we'd met before, we hadn't, but it's wonderful. Um, so this was for a project uh, around open practice um, that I um, facilitated within my institution. It was called the Know How Project, and it was very much about um, staff and students experiencing open education. Um, and we had a, a group of staff and students who were all working in different times, who were all based in different parts of the university, who chose a particular area of open education to investigate. So we used a shared group within Mahara in order to um, connect and collaborate with each other. But of course, they also had their private spaces where they could um, draw things together and work through their thinking. And because we'd done all this within um, our, our ePortfolio platform, it was actually very easy then to make some of these uh, notes publicly available and to turn this into an open educational resource um, that can be revisited at, at, later, at a later time and that uh, people can continue to connect with. Um, so collaborative practice really um, taking place through Mahara in both private and shared spaces with both staff and students working together. So what can you do with an e-portfolio? Well, these are just some of the things that uh, some of our users have said we can do. And I think that word meaning actually jumps out at me right now. And that's because this is, this is a tool where if you've thought through your construct and you've thought through your purpose and you've thought through your presence within, um, within an e-portfolio tool, you can create really meaningful learning experiences. So what can you do with an e-portfolio? You can do whatever you need to do. And I think you'll be surprised sometimes at what comes out as well. If you give people access to a platform like this where they have some autonomy and where they have the uh, ability to use it almost as a domain of their own um, to create web pages that they can then share with each other. And my final slide here is just to point to this particular um, quite prescient article that came out in 2014. Um, this is a, a book chapter. And as you can see, this, is really, this really highlights how important it is for educators to understand the implications of the use of technology. We tend to meet technology in the context of solutionism, that the tech will solve your problem. That, that is never true. So we have to look at that critically. The tech will produce lots of additional problems that you didn't think about. What matters is why you want to use it and the purpose of the technology. So if you focus on the workshop um, part of this session today on the purpose and your presence within the technology, you're going to get much closer to a really good e-portfolio. Um, this particular book chapter has some really nice vignette of practice, so um, I would really recommend it. I'm going to just stop my screen sharing now, but what I want to do is to pop into the chat a link to my blog post, because I'm aware that you will have had um, quite a lot of talk being talked at there, um, for which I apologise. Um, but you'll find in that blog post some further links and some things to follow up if anything of what I've shown to you is of interest. So um, it's quite a short blog post, not loads of extra reading, but a little bit hopefully that might uh, point you in the direction if something that I've said is of interest. Thank you all very much for your attention. and uh, I look forward to any questions or queries you may have. Thanks, Teresa. So yeah, we have, we have a few minutes for questions now. So either come in by mic or chat, whichever you're comfortable with. We might let the inimitable Tom Farrelly um, moderate it. Do the honours there, there. Yeah, absolutely. For Iman or for Teresa. Stunned silence, that's, that's what always happens when you come to questions, isn't it? Please do feel free though to pop questions in the chat at any point during this morning. I'll uh, be very willing to engage with you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, could I ask a question, actually? 
and Kennedy, close to Dooling. Um, so Teresa is very interested in the fact that you were obviously using it for languages, even though I'm a maths teacher. Um, did you find that there was any advantage in using ePortfolio for assessment um, as, a, as a part of the learning um, for kind of concrete, you know, do they know their verbs? I'm assuming in, <laughs> I'm, I'm casting my memory back to leaving Sir French at this point. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And um, thanks. That's a lovely question. And, and actually, uh, we, our disciplines may be different, but the skills are very similar, aren't they? You, they do. You have to acquire them incrementally and you have to continually return to them. And, and one of the wonderful things that the ePortfolio did for us was to make students focus on that journey, on that process of learning. So whether they were learning Russian or you know learning Japanese and Chinese with a totally new script they're going through a journey that is particularly challenging and by focusing their attention and let's be honest that putting 20% mark on it <laughs> focuses the attention wonderfully um, actually on that process and how they're experiencing that process and we share openly with them the criteria for marking the portfolio and that is all documented again from the blog post you'll see that there's a set of criteria that we look at um, we don't look at the language so they, they they're free to express themselves in English or in the language they're learning and most do a mixture of both but their language is entirely assessed in the eight, other 80 percent what we do look at is their ability to analyze and take um, suitable, make suitable decisions about changing their learning practice. Um, so that, that's the sort of thing, it's the so what factor. So if you found learning verbs really difficult, what did you choose to do about it? How did you go about? Um, so really we're getting them to think about the learning process. Um, and students very much at the beginning of this, and as I say, we've been doing this for some years, at the beginning of this, they would come to us and say, well, why do I have to do this? This isn't, this isn't language learning, this is something else. And we'd say, well, give it a try. And then usually halfway through, um, you know, they come back and say, this has been really useful. This, you know, this has been, in some cases, they've come back to us and said, this has been the most useful use of my time, not just for my language learning, but across my degree. Um, so we've had really, really positive feedback, but not without necessarily a little bit of resistance at first. <laughs> Teresa, there's a, a, a few people who put up questions, but the first person who raised their hand is Neve McRae. Neve, do you want to come in? And then I'll call in the other people who put in chat into uh, the chat function. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Teresa. Maybe I'm preempting what's coming later, but um, you mentioned that you used it for, let's say, 20% Presumably that depended on across the years and stuff like that. Have you ever used it to assess the whole module a hundred percent, like with different yes. elements? I'm so, you're asking great questions because that's it's something else that I missed as I rushed, rushed through. The, in the second example I gave, um, that was a hundred percent e-portfolio assessed. Okay. And mm -hmm. of course last year, because that was the January to March term, <coughs> we were in lockdown at the end of, um, at the, end of the term but that didn't affect our assessment. So while everybody else was running around trying to find alternative ways of assessing modules, we already had an e-portfolio in place. We had a shared group within that e-portfolio. So I was able to continue to support the students and they were able to continue to submit and their e-portfolio was 100% okay. um, the assessment for that module. Okay, and, 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 sorry, can I, sorry. Sorry, go on, yeah. Uh, again maybe this will be double like and would you have graded it incrementally as you went along or was it all did they did they get feedback as they were going along on the different elements of the portfolio or was it all just summative feedback at the end or right so we have again it was a hundred it was a hundred percent e-portfolio assessed with the criteria for assessment shared with them near the beginning of the course so they knew what they were working towards in that particular construct we were encouraging them to be resident within uh, the portfolio tools so that they could interact and they could ask questions um, so there was uh, their their reflective journal that they kept throughout was private to them unless they chose to share uh -huh. it okay. yeah. so they could choose to share elements of that with perhaps peers within the group or with myself if they wanted feedback during 
the course but actually it was the summative assessment so they didn't other than getting feedback on the sorts of things we'd expect them to include in the final yeah. portfolio they didn't uh they didn't get any um, formative feedback on the portfolio itself. Hmm. Um, they, they. But I guess in principle that. you could if it was a longer. Absolutely, result, you yeah, could. Yeah, it's all yeah. about the construct, isn't it? So it's all yeah. about defining your purpose and finding the, the construct for assessment that works um, in your context. Okay, I've done it that much. way, Neve. I've done it feed, feedback after each entry and then mark at the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have I, I, the eye on Connor, but a few written questions. I've copied them down. First one here, Teresa, um, from Christina. What would you recommend to a tutor or instructor who wants to start with a portfolio to do first? I suppose the, the, the first big, big item, big item tickets that you you tell them to, to do. One of the things, well, the first thing I would always say with any digital tool is get in there yourself and try it out. Um, make sure you've experienced it. Um, so that would be my first thing always. And the second thing is to, you know, check out uh, the literature and the openly shared um, examples. Um, Lisa, Lisa put together a wonderful ebook on assessment through ePortfolio. Um, and I'm sure we've got a link if you've not already had that. Um, so this, it's good to read other people's examples. I think these, these things are quite difficult to uh, conceptualize in your own practice without experiencing them through the lens, if you like, of other people's practice and deciding whether they would work for you. And the, the third thing, if I may, would be to work collaboratively with the students so that there's a design cycle. Just with any learning technology design, you take feedback, you take um, uh, experiences from students um, and you know if you're lucky you'll have a wonderful student like Iman who gives you really helpful feedback um, around what works and, and hopefully probably what doesn't as well because you can learn just as much from what doesn't. Uh, okay next question from Claire interested in using portfolio as a staff resource for CPD so any recommendations? I, I think it's it's fabulous for that. I think it's it's ideal for that. That third example I gave you for the We're Here project, um, the battle, as with any uh, technology, is actually getting people resident within the space. Um, but what I always try and uh, encourage people to do with uh, Mahara, for example, is get in there and make a page for yourself, try it out, um, then share it, see what it's like. Um, so yeah, I think it's very, very useful for um, CPD. Even if you just keep it privately and personally to yourself. And one of the things that I did with my um, use of Mahara was to uh, pull together a page that then I included my open badges in my digital badges and things and then I used it as evidence for my certification uh, in the for the association for learning technology um, the great thing about it as well is you can export all of your data so although a lot of the uh, work I did in Mahara initially was in the institutional hosting I now have a space on folio spaces um, which is hosted externally it was very easy to export all my um, e-portfolio work and continue there so folio spaces is now where I continue my learning journey okay uh you're going to be on the clock in a second Lisa has yeah, that hand up here, so. yeah I, I just want to jump in on the back of the CPD question and I popped it into the chat e-portfolio Ireland did do a session to support the use of a teaching portfolio or a professional portfolio um and we ran that webinar for it was it was, it was real real time actually it was real people in the flesh um, but I, I've just popped a link to that um, seminar into the chat. So you may find some interesting things there as we looked at mapping um, across a number of different frameworks um, and, and the kinds of elements or categories that you might want to include in a CPD e-portfolio. I think you did the National Forum one and the HEA one, was it, Lisa? Was there another one? It's the National Forum, uh, Advanced HE, and our own DCU academic promotion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. So I've got to quickly put these to you. Um, so it's three questions one from Ruth Madison, uh, one from Emer Joyce, and I'm Connor Den. So I thought the, the quickest one to answer first Did your students have a good level of digital skills before starting to use the portfolio? It, typically, they had a huge range. 
students and staff alike. I don't know why we sort of tend to just focus on students' digital skills, but you know, actually, you know, there's a journey for all of us. Um, so no, not necessarily. And uh, certainly in the early days, people would come back and say, why must I use this tool? Um, and, and there it, it actually comes down to the construct. You know, we're, we're looking at how you can manage in, in the same tool because we've got 150 students doing it. Yeah. Um, so uh, they certainly increased their digital competence. OK, next one. Did you find the students use their portfolio after they completed the course? And do you know what they've done? Even just a couple of examples. Some have. Yeah, some have. And um, some contacted me about where they could export it once they uh, left the university. And uh, that was all very straightforward. Um, I think for some, it's a journey that takes them into the potential of managing their digital identity and maybe takes them towards getting their own website or setting up their own um, a, a space of their own. Um, so it varies. Yeah, yeah. And uh, finally, uh, Connor O'Neill in the sunny southeast there. He's uh, probably following the Stevie's way. Not at all. Very welcome. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, hi, Teresa. Hi. Uh, My question is around resistance from students, you know, especially, you know, in early parts, pilot projects or things like that. So did you come across it and how did you deal with it? Uh, yes, we came across it. it. It wasn't terribly extensive, to be honest. Um, a, a, you know, a few students came forward, uh, particularly in that first use case where we had a, a sort of uh, compulsory um, creation of an e-portfolio for their assessment. Um, how we dealt with it essentially was to talk to people. You know, we had sessions, so we had a one drop-in session uh, a term, so three in that particular use case, um, where they came with their questions and we just talked to, I, I talked to them about it and why we needed them to do it and where the help was. And uh, generally, because students talk to other students they then you know talk to students from last year and they say oh actually it turned out to be quite good and and so it was a diminishing problem um and the other thing that we did was to provide lots of little um, video tutorials so my youtube channel warwick language on youtube you'll see there's lots of little mahara um tutorials there that we shared every year um so making sure that you're present enough in the environment um we didn't ask tutors to be very present in it. They've got lots of other things that they had to be doing. Um, but we did have, um, a, I did have a presence within uh, the online environment. So any queries and questions could come through that. Brilliant. Th 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 thanks very much for that, Teresa. I'm going to hand you back to, to Lisa, but myself and Lisa and Arna will be will be monitoring the uh, the chat and look, we, we'll try and keep things going. Once again, thanks very much, Teresa. A, a real pleasure. Uh, I'll hand back to you, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Teresa. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to respond there to Anna was just asking, looking for, for additional examples of e-portfolios. Well, by the end of today, you're going to be creating at least a, the, an outline of your own e-portfolio based uh, examples. So there's a lot more to come and I'm more than happy to share any examples that we have here within DCU. Uh, and I'll actually, once uh, our next guest is speaking, I'll pop the link to our public um, support page for our own ePortfolio installation here within DCU, because there's a number of student examples there. Right, so I just need to share my screen again and make sure that I have, because <laughs> I just pulled out there. Here we go, wrong thing, here we go. I'm just moving forward swiftly through your, your conversation there, Teresa. And we have gotten beyond our comments. And now I'd really like to welcome a good colleague of mine, Aurelie um, Soulier, who's with uh, UCL over in London. And she's going to join us now and speak a little bit about her vast experience within ePortfolio, but also is going to put you through your own paces with regards to creating, or uh, she's going to help you uh, create your own e-portfolio based assessment. So without further ado, can I pass you on to Orly? Orly, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, let you do it, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the introduction. I am not too sure about the vast experience, but <laughs> I have some experience. Uh, let me share. 
think that should be okay. Uh, you can tell me if it's not, if I now present. Uh, can you see my screen? All good. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, um, so yeah, so just a, a quick introduction um, about uh, myself. Um, uh, so I, um, my experience with the portfolio started back in 2015, roughly. I've been a learning technology since 2006, working with various environments, but um, we had Mahara on our platform in 2012 already, but not very much use. And then came along wonderful Sam Taylor, then some of you might know, or, uh, might have seen in other portfolio events uh, or, or Moodle event. And Sam actually introduced me to... Um, uh, Mahara at the time, but also the world of ePortfolios in general. And in 2015, I went to my first Mahara conference where I kind of had that light bulb moment about what ePortfolios can do and uh, got really inspired. Um, the activities we're going to do today uh, in designing your portfolio activities together. So we're going to design your own portfolio uh, that was inspired and, and, and uh, designed with initially uh, Sam in 2018 for a, a Mahoudol event. And then I ran it again in um, RAU with Marika, who's in the audience today, um, and, um, and then uh, just refined it of, over the years. So. Um, uh, today we're going to deliver in a slightly online, which I've never done before, so it's been face to face, so um, uh, we're going to uh, try, try and enjoy that together. Uh, just before we design that, um, so for me an e-portfolio is the same uh, than a portfolio you would have on paper, except it's got additional benefits of um, having uh, richer resources and uh, being able to move things around a lot easier than you would do on paper as you know in the olden days in massive folder that you would have. Um, so what's the ideal portfolio? Going back to owner's um, learning portfolio uh, definition earlier and, and the definition from uh, Aynan and Clark, um, there are various definitions but for me uh, typically, and showing, um, and with the examples that um, Teresa uh, gave us, it can vary quite a lot. Um, the key ingredients are traditionally a statement of competency, evidence, and reflection, but they might be in different doses, and you'll make your own meal. I love food analogies, so you'll get a lot of that. Um, but basically, you make your own portfolio based on what uh, your purpose is, so it goes back to the contract, construct that Teresa was mentioning, and and, um, and um, making it fit your assessment, because that's what we're here for today about we're looking at assessment of your portfolio. So making sure it's assessment first in mind. What do you try to do? Is it showing evidence to, to fill a statement of competency and adding reflection, etc.? cetera? Uh, so it's just looking at how much of these are going to be in your portfolio. Um, so just a, a very quick uh, activity in the chat, if you could. Um, what would be a good use of a new portfolio? Uh, not necessarily in your subject, but it can be in your subject today, what you're thinking about. Uh, think of specifically um, um, something that might replace what paper portfolio would do, but also not just that, what else can it do that the paper wouldn't do? You know, what would any portfolio bring you and, and in terms of assessment? So if you want to put a few things in the chat, I need to work out how to get off my full screen. <laughs> without changing slides. Um. Chat, that's the one. <laughs> okay, so we've got uh, placement logs and journal, multimodal video, audio. Well, thanks for the ESKP. <laughs> um, Multimedia, multimodal element. Yes, so using different media is, is, is important. But again, it's not about forcing people to use media that they don't want to use. It's, it needs to be for a purpose. Um, reflective practice, demonstration of skills. And all these, as you reflected earlier in the questions, actually, um, may depend on digital skills that students already have, or it may be with a name to build those digital skills. So for example, use a video uh, in exercise instruction, uh, resume, uh, so CV and bios, research, 
Yeah, so I have a few examples of research ones I can't show today uh, because they are not part of the institution anymore, but I can talk about uh, any of those later with anybody interested around research and around group work for modules as well in engineering. Okay, we've got loads of great ideas. Keep, keep them coming. I'm going to start going through so we can uh, go to, to our uh, workshop part in a bit and explain to you what we're going to do today. But just before that, uh, what I wanted to, to make sure you know uh, is that um, uh, there's a, a rubric, a holy grail of rubric in portfolio, which is linked uh, and I think Lisa might just put the link in the chat or somebody will as well, uh, which has been developed by ePortfolio Ireland as a kind of crowdsource rubric. Um, and that will help you when you first start assessing, actually looking at what you can assess in any portfolio. So you can use it as such or you can add your own you know, subject specific uh, uh, elements in there. Uh, it's really in terms of giving you um, some way of assessing a portfolio. So if you're not sure how to um, assess it, there's a rubric for that. So here we go. Uh, so what we're going to do today, I'm quite excited to run it online for the first time. So um, don't, don't rush too, too much. You're going to be put into groups and we're going to design a, a portfolio activities together. And for this, I mean, design what the activities will look like. So the, the exercise, if you want. So you're going to write a brief, you're going to set some parameters and requirements and we'll help you with that. We'll give you a list of things to look at, uh, but it's not just limited to that. You can think of other factors as well. And if you have time, and hopefully you have time to draw a little bit, you can draw a mock-up of how it could look. So you could do that on a piece of paper at home, or you could use um, a tool online. Um, but if you don't have time to do that and you want to scribble, you could um, always describe your picture when we come to the show and tell later, if you want to show and share or show on cameras to your group. Uh, so just use your imagination and, and, and think about um, uh, following the requirements, basically. So um, just in groups, so your mission is to describe and design a portfolio activity um, that will allow students to demonstrate knowledge, skill, application, and or reflection. So to whatever degree you want these ingredients to be part of the portfolio on your given topics and context. So um, you will um, be able to choose in your group a topic, but if you're stuck, we will be able to give you some examples and topics and briefs ready-made uh, because we don't want you to be stuck on that. You, we want you to go through the process of designing the portfolio. So the considerations, these will be in your groups as well. You'll be able to see them on, on, on the breakout room. So you don't have to write them all down now. Um, so the things you need to consider is what's the focus? So is it an employability? So you have all actually have just dropped in the chat ideas of, of these. Is it a personal development portfolio? Has it got academic credit? Is it a combination of those, some of those factors? Um, who are your students? Are they first year, second year, MSc, CPD, PhD student researchers, staff? Um, are they full-time, part-time? So what's the mode of, of engagement? Uh, is it distance blended on-site? Is it normally full-time face-to-face, but at the moment um, um, on um, distance only? Uh, is it a blend? Um, individual, group, pairs, um, whatever you, the, the portfolio needs to be relevant to your assessment in this case. Uh, Who will be your audience? Uh, lecturer, employer, peers? Uh, is it open to everyone? And uh, or is it just a lecturer and the external examiner? Um, the size. So that's always a tricky one. And we get a lot of questions around this. Um, how big is a portfolio? Um, and you, it's not something you can put a word count on often, especially if you've got multimedia elements. So is it, can you estimate in hours um, how much you expect the students to spend on it? Minimum, maximum, maybe. Is that something that you want to limit? Um, word count equivalence. Some people do put an equivalent because of university regulations still being fixed in the ways of word counts for essays. And, um, or a number of artifacts. Are you going to say, I don't look at more than 10 artifacts, or I want a minimum of three videos? You know, what, what are, what's the size? 
and what expected contents do you have? Do you uh, are welcome any content? Are you going to be able to read and, and go through all type of content? files, images, videos, text, audio animation, but also are you expecting to have main content and appendix effectively with additional documents? So just differentiating where the content may be. And uh, a lot of questions are often around this area as well, which is the academic conduct. So ensuring you a uh, model, you know, good referencing, attribution of, of um, pictures, which is really easy in a lot of uh, platforms. And we, we talked about Mahara, for example, but this is about, it's a platform agnostic. So think about designing a portfolio for any assessment exercise that we use an e-portfolio. Um, and also copyright. So how, how that's going to be sourced or are they just guided to a guidance on how to, to do that? So just think about this. And this is uh, the, some examples of some outputs that we had from this uh, workshop before. So just to give you an idea, some brief with those elements focus, who are your students, just quick questions, drop that down. And uh, there might be an example like Marika shows us here uh, about uh, a portfolio um, and different elements uh, that, where they might be on the screen for students. So kind of a template if you want an output. I hope that makes sense. Yes, there's a there's a Google Slides for them to use. I think really for the yep. breakout activity. Do, do, do you want to? I've put already them? popped that into the chat. Yeah. Okay. So Lisa yeah. will share that Brilliant. after you've all been into your groups. We'll come back and regroup, and we'll give a couple of people. We can't show every single example, but the opportunity to to ask for feedback and show their brief, their requirements, their vision. Um, but we'll also go around the rooms and, and have a look and help you and, and see if we can, um, you know, give feedback at that point as well. Um, so um, at the end, we'll all have designed something and we'll have some slides where you can actually put some of these. So you can, you have these, you'll be able to take that away in terms of ideas and group of, and you'll have some time as well to look at others, a couple of minutes, so you can then ask com uh, questions and, and comments. Um, little bonus point for thinking about after today, what needs further design work? What else do you need to think about? Uh, what's the next step for implementation for you? Um, Lisa, do you want to take? Okay, if you're ready, uh, by the power of magic, you're about to be transported into your breakout rooms. Enjoy. So everybody should have an invite to a room. So Christina and Nicole just came in there late, Lisa, so you might need to assign her. Yeah. That looks like most everybody has at least a couple of people in their room. Do you have a timer on? I don't have a timer on, but I do. I'm keeping an eye on it. So um, how long are they in there? About 20 minutes? 15. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's at least three to four in every room. So I think we are good. Okay, cool. Just going to pause the room. I haven't really moved around from one room to another because I stayed with my group and uh, we, we built a, a lovely portfolio on uh, um, business, uh, building business in food sector. Um, and uh, that was really interesting looking through all the considerations. Um, let me go back to the slides briefly and then we can see if anybody wants to um, share. So uh, Lisa, did you want um, to, us to give people to look through others now or should we um, have a brief uh, outline of somebody who wants to share first? However you want to do it. Okay, I'm just going to do the, the kind of show and tell and then we can give everyone two minutes to look at those slides, go back on that document and look at everybody's um, um, everybody's feedback. That's not working. I can only share on full screen. Okay, whoops. So, um, oh, we missed this. <laughs> oh, forgot to do that. 
Yes, not to worry. I don't know if I can play now. Here we go. We had the breakout. Um, oh, keep, um, okay. So show and tell. So can will anyone? So we didn't have time, for example, to do the vision, the design, the template, the output. But that's okay because you can. You know that you can do that later. What I do advise though, when you do design a new portfolio activity is do go through that bit. I know it might be a little bit, um, if my field is gimmicky to try and design, you know, your, your uh, portfolio, as we could see on uh, this slide here. So those kind of, you know, outlines, etc. But actually it makes you go through uh, what the students might need to consider. And it's something you can actually show the students as well as I'm, I'm kind of something that might be um, expected and for them to visualize a possible output something they can improve on, vary from, is really useful. For that, sometimes templates may be useful, but however, and I know that um, Marika con con uh, uh, commented on the chat about this earlier, if it's too uh, rigid, templates can be uh, a problem as well. So it's varying between what's the minimum you want on the template and uh, not um, limiting uh, the student's creativity in that uh, case. So uh, would anyone uh, from the groups volunteer to share or, or just ask for feedback, doesn't have to share a finished product. And I can actually have a look at the slide and you can talk over it uh, about your brief, your requirements, anything else that you have thought about and considered or questions you have that were unanswered in your group work. Anyone? Want to raise your hands? Don't be shy. Orly, I'm happy to talk if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me. I'm going to share my screen while you talk, and I am going to. You're going to tell me which group you are in, so that I can uh, jump back to that. Let me uh, go back to this one. Uh, so, which group were you in? Group eight. Okay. Let's go to eight. We have loads of work. I love this. It's beautiful. <laughs> uh, you'll have a minute in a. Uh, oh, you didn't write anything in here. No, we didn't. No, so we oh, show. you just talk through it. So let me stop sharing. Then you talk. This is why I'm going first because um, I want to. <laughs> I don't want to see everybody else's great work and then go. Oh no. Um, uh, I was with a lovely woman called Sue from the UK and a colleague actually in uh, IT Carlo where. Um, a lecture as well so that was nice just three of us so we had a wonderful wonderful chat and um really uh, i suppose our key takeaway from it is very much how e-portfolios marry with, with that big question of what is the role of higher education because if we try to be restrictive in explaining exactly what an e-portfolio is um you're not really you, you know we've a lot of especially with us we've got undergraduate students and sometimes, you know, coming from the second level education where, okay, tell us exactly A, B, C, D, how many words, this came up in our discussion, how many videos, exactly what should it be like? And, you know, it's, uh, as, a, as I often say to students, like it can be like heaven, whatever you want it to be or not, you know? So it's about creating not necessarily a framework, but also, of course, we agreed that they do need some guidance. We discussed about the whole thing of the digital, uh, software facilities that are available for two of us in the group. It was our first time ever hearing of Mahara. So um, there is a lot of a learning curve there in relation to it. But we do, we, with that caveat, that it's not just about the digital, obviously, and it's about the creation of whatever it is. Now, we did from um, uh, the lovely associate professor, uh, Teresa, is this Teresa, who put up slides? And I found myself thinking uh, like a student that if somebody was giving me this assessment, what would I do? Uh, and there was, a, there was a, a design on one of Teresa's slides, which was not like this now, but it was something like this. But I thought if I was doing one and I was asked to create a portfolio, let's say to prepare for uh, my professional work in future years, that I would find this very valuable, this almost wheel. And we all said like, you know, that about me, uh, my uh, education to date, my experiences to date, my interests, hobbies, all of that. And uh, we said it was very powerful. And from that, the group also talked about how this actually could, uh, there's a graduate attributes framework that we actually do in the college. And one of the, my colleagues said that would be very helpful in marrying with that. Or Sue from the UK also said, that really you could even build around it and even put in um, 
you know, videos for each segment or whatever. But what we really were very for, very adamant about though is, you know, we can't just give this as a framework because then all our students will just do wheels and we mm -hmm. don't want that, you know? So it is about making sure that we give that freedom of expression to let it be whatever it is within the restrictions of learning outcomes that have to be done and all those box ticking exercises that have to happen. So I hope that's helpful. That's wonderful. I really love this. I love your idea. But also it's, it's that freedom. So it's about uh, giving them that space to learn and show they've learned. Um, but so the assessment, I mentioned the rubric earlier, giving them the assessment criteria and just letting them hit whatever they think fits to that is brilliant. So the advantage of a platform like Mahara, for example, is that you could have them saying, oh, yeah, I demonstrate that attribute on this part of the, the wheel or whatever it is, a portfolio page, etc. cetera. Um, but um, you don't have to have Mahara to, to do that. And I think Ona's just commented uh, things like WordPress and um, um, you know, some other web platform, as long as you can add you know, whatever um, artifacts you decided to put in there. Um, I mean, um, I worked with uh, some people who had you know, still to create something on a zip file you know, where they had to link everything together. Um, so it, it depends what you want as indicator, the output to be so you can assess it in a, in a way that can be also maybe reviewed by external examiners or employers, whatever the context is. So um, I, I love the idea that it's a space for them to, to create, and um, um, but it needs to be linked to the criteria, yeah. Um, any, other, any other shares? Uh, number Tom. three, Tom? group three. Yeah, let's have a look at group three. And go back up. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not a cat, by the way. <laughs> that um, was my line. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, and, and the mean the meaning of the cat will be will be clear. I wanted to jump ahead because like Pauline jumped in before Emily had had we just sat there and chatted about considerations rather than come up with a specific one but i thought just some of the issues here at the moment that, you know is it someone to perform if it's always going to be one of those things i think one of the things we all talked about was this danger of style over substance what is the purpose of it uh, and and uh, i mean like the, the isabel and, uh, and mary and today we're also with the importance of the rubrics which paul even just mentioned there i think you need that guide and what's that balance going to be between say if it's a, if a reflective practice portfolio, then what's that balance between technical and reflection? But then again, if it's a showcase one where you have maybe multimedia students, they need to show off stuff. So I think it's, it's about, so you need to consider what is the purpose. And if it is about reflection, it's make sure you design a rubric which is fit for purpose and you don't get carried away. So as I said, if you're a nurse, it, you know, okay, so the Powtoon video wasn't brilliant, but you know, what was the most important thing? The, the skills and, and I saw some of the stuff there talking about Mahar and OneNote and, and WordPress and all, but it depends. And as I said, like we had people in the group who were also there maybe in adult and community sectors. They don't necessarily have a recourse to Pathbright or PebblePad or, or So you need to think about what's the issues. And I suppose, you know, does the medium become overcome the message then? But I, I think the reason the cat's up there, just, I think one of the really big things there that was mentioned there is about copyright issues and creative commons and fair use. Uh, and, and, and one of the group was talking about like there's been issues of schools where, you know, students are, are, are if they don't understand and they're downloading images and suddenly somebody's coming after you. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, we need to consider there to some of the considerations. Anybody else in the group who wants to? just say something about it as i said we didn't actually design we just talked about the things you need no but those considerations are important and the last bit on the copyright it's also about equipping them to learn to deal with these things and that's yeah. that's a massive skill to gain yeah yeah that's really important so and, and that that uh, picture of the cat is from uh, wiki commons i just checked thank you and one thing that we haven't mentioned or i haven't seen mentioned is accessibility as well uh, yes. it's a big consideration yeah i'll just stop sharing if uh, i can't see the comments yet in the chat but uh, um any anyone else or should we have a couple of minutes just to look so if you uh, do we need to repost the links because they're quite far up in the chat 
if we have a look again at uh, at these and if you have any questions for others um so i don't know how far through everybody's gone uh, i'm going to have a look myself now we needed some music at this point lisa i think <laughs> i'll turn on alexa what would we all like to hear i normally throw on some vivaldi as background noise but if anybody wants anything else uh, my alexa will certainly accommodate uh plastic bear trial uh, okay, we'll, we'll we'll go with the uh, Vivaldi then, will we? <laughs> Dance monkey, <laughs> or maybe breakout. Seeing as, as we're talking about breakout rooms, um, so Orly, do you want to give people then time to, to to have a look through at this point the different? Yeah, I think it'd be nice, and then ask um, in a so have a look at this while you um, if you if you can do with um, different screens while you also have uh, drop things in the chat or um, ask directly um, uh, people in the chat if, if you want to. Um, oh, yes, you might need a broadcast license. <laughs> you might not be able to use public heaven. Um, um, so... Turn off the recording and no one, no one tell on us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so have a quick look. I'm, I'm looking through the different breakout rooms and, um, and, and there are some, some good examples. I know that not many people have been able to go through the last stage, which is the actual design. Uh, but if you have, and if you have something in front of you on paper and you want to show to everyone on camera afterwards, uh, after we've all had a look in the next minute or two, um, just uh, let's share. So uh, I'll say just another minute uh, have a look on the breakout rooms uh, on the slides. I, I was in breakout room four and Deirdre had a lovely um, example of the technology improving the way she could work with um, businesses. I don't know whether she feels like opening a mic and talking us through it, but Yes, um, I can. No problem. Um, what I was explaining, and it's probably just the brief is there, but um, I work with a live company. Um, it's master students. It's a capstone module, strategic marketing management. Um, but we work with a live company and the first piece is strategic analysis and the second piece is, is, a, is a marketing plan plan. Um, but we were just, I was just figuring out how, you know, because we work this live company, we have a link in the organization to various people working there. But, you know, they come in and they present to the class. Um, obviously, it's an online setting at the moment. Um, but when they leave, then all of the questions and everything gets channeled, you know, to me, I have to go back to the company, they come back to me just for data you know, reasons and every and not them being bombarded individually by lots of students as well. So it's kind of coming that way. But whereas we, you could use Mahara or a platform whereby the company employees can check in the status of the projects, you know, and where they're at. Um, then I, I suppose if you break it down into deliverables which they are it is broke down into deliverables um you know what i tend to do is meet them in their groups uh but that can be uh you know again in the in the portfolio reflections in there at each stage as opposed to reflections at the end you know peer assessment so it's just i think i i think the system i'd have to get used to the system obviously but i think it could work nicely because it's 100 percent ca as well uh this module uh, and it would work well um in terms of you know, you know, formative assessment the whole way through um, and then being able to reflect the whole way through as well, as opposed to when a piece is finished, you know, um, and even with each other, I think just in terms of two team and group work, you'd visibly see how that's working as well. Now, look, I'm not familiar with this system, but I think potentially it could work well for, you know, a, a module such as this, where you're working with a live company as well and figure out where the visibility is. And we, we had a really good discussion actually at the end about, uh, Teresa, you probably helped me with this, is that you, the data protection reasons, obviously a lot of students then they're, we're getting them industry ready. So, and when they ha they're producing their LinkedIn profiles, they have to have a, a portfolio of work that they've done um, and employers are looking for that now when they're searching and selecting individuals uh, to work for the organization. So it's become really important that their LinkedIn profiles have, you know, portfolios of their work um, to highlight. And um, so Therese was saying you could extract parts of 
you know, of it out, you know, what, obviously some of it will be owned by us in terms of giving feedback, but certain parts of it can be extracted out maybe and into a separate platform and, and then used as their e-portfolio potentially um, for their career development. That- You've hit on a, a really <laughs> interesting strand there, Deirdre, yeah. the employability one. And, mm. and I've, I've actually been at an interview panel when someone had a portfolio and it yeah. did give them an edge because I could I could see I could see evidence of what they could do. Yeah. Not just what they were talking about. I could see a product yeah, that they had exactly. made. Yeah. Yeah. Here's and because they're working with a live company, they say, look, here's the brand plan I produced for that organization. We found out that this is where their weaknesses were. And here it is what we did. And the visibility of it makes a huge difference. And employers are saying that that's what they're looking for. I thought this idea really worked very well as a, you know through any portfolio tool and that the beauty of have uh, making people curate their experience and, and yeah. drawing their attention to the learning and the process helps yeah. them transfer those skills in future so that further down the line if they change employment or whatever they've got a set of skills to reflect and um, sort of reorient their evidence for a different audience. It helps them to find that audience and to focus on um, how they show those skills. Um, And and actually just to clarify on the sort of technical details, if if you're using Mahara, for example, um, you can export everything you've done in Mahara into um, folio spaces, for example, outside the institution. Um, to continue Um, but equally wherever you are you can uh, copy and drag and drop bits of the evidence that you've collected for one purpose and reuse it for another purpose so it becomes I mean that that's one of the sort of light bulb moments that students find when I talk to them about making an e-portfolio that you don't have to write it all out again you can copy this block and pop it in another page um, and, and, you know, they instantly see the point of that. <laughs> yeah. There are literally sort of radio buttons you can select and move all of this into this portfolio. And those sort of time savers are vital. Um, well, even moving say, from undergrad to postgrad. If, yes, if totally. That's the, yeah, potential yeah. as well. Yeah. I think one of the things, one of the issues that we get with technology is there is a there is a cost. There is a, 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 obviously a financial cost, but there's also a time cost, and we need to make the te- make sure that the technology makes things easier for us and not harder. <laughs> that's that sounds really good, and it it just goes back to um, your you talk about the the resident thing earlier as well the more you invest your time in the technology the more proficient you'll be um, as well so um, that's good um, um, do we have any other comments or um, I'm just going to move to um, my quick uh, tips to finish my um, section uh, oh present <laughs> there we go so we've done uh, this show and tell. So think about what else uh, will need further design in, in, in your portfolio, but you can reuse the same exercise and the same considerations to build any portfolio assessment. Um, it's like a, a, a checklist, if you want, for, for your portfolio. Um, so my top tips personally, always, always, always think of assessment first. Why? So, so why are you doing the portfolio? You know, what's the purpose? Always think of your purpose in terms of you design about the students. Why are they? What are they building um, in there? Um, human touch, so presence, echoing what Teresa said earlier, having that, um, uh, talking to the students directly. So make sure you're involved. But a lot of people have been mentioning in the group work as well, the, uh, the support needed. So how do you make it um, easier for them to get used to the platform and support, support, support. So being present for them um, is very important. And and even more now as we're um, less physically connected. Accessibility, make sure um, you you check basics like, um, um, or teach students the basics of having uh, alternative text on an image, for example, font size, contrast, headings, using headings, very important. Um, uh, but also just uh, just giving them an introduction to to how it affects everyone. Um, so my big big advice is it's hard to get it right right the first time. Try it, get feedback on your design, but also on your implementation. Um, 
uh, reserve some time and space to implement changes based on the feedback as well and, and try again. And um, there's an iterative process. We, we can only make it better. And some things don't work as well as you plan with one group, but as I found out, it works really well with another group. So it's also finding uh, that pace. Um, please um, have a look at Sam's OER, so Sam Taylor's uh, uh, open educational resource on the ALT website about um, how to, you know, building these basic e-portfolios. So some people ask about e-portfolio examples. This is a tool to build your portfolio activities as well, um, based around the same principles we've discussed today. Uh, so that's a great resources and uh, good luck with it. Super. Thanks, Orly. Oh, stop <laughs> Thanks, Orly. And just before we leave here and leave Orly, um, does anybody have any questions directly that, that we haven't already answered either in the chat or Orly hasn't answered or that you'd like to share with the wider group or any comments just to invite you to, to contribute to that now? There's one in the chat there, um, Lisa. Does, does Mahari integrate with Canvas? Christine is off the call, I think, is she? I think it does, but uh, don't quote me on it. But I think yeah, it I think it does too. Yeah, there is a connection for it, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, different platforms connect in various, in di different ways. So it may be that you can submit assessment, maybe that, you know, they are workarounds for these things. Yeah, and I see there that, that we will um, we will put the video on the ePortfolio Ireland website when, when we're when we finished the session. I see there in there. What video reflections? That's an interesting one. Anyone got a suggestion for video reflections? Like you could just do it in in a Mahara or in a but Flipgrid. I know people use for video reflections. Any other suggestions there? Our students are using Zoom. They're recording themselves in Zoom, and then just using the link that comes out of uh, the Zoom account. Very simple. Samples. A lot of them use their mobile phones as well. Yeah. 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 That's, that would be my experience. Mobile, yeah. OK, um, I'm just. I, um, when a lot, of a lot of students, and a good thing to do as well is to use uh, screencasts. So in, to get them to do a screencast and reflect on some of the work they might have done, it's quite popular within the post-primary sort of space and um, to use a good screencast to sort of reflect on if it's a bit of artwork they've done or whatnot, put it into your project then. It's a nice idea. Also maybe to actually explain how you went about the process of a piece of work can be quite interesting. Sure. I've seen people do that with um, coding actually um because because the whole issue of plagiarism and coding so to to do a screencast of how they went about it as a kind of a quality assurance measure i thought it was kind of interesting mm. and i see actually one of my old colleagues from my um masters in uh, applied e-learning here geraldine and uh, we had to use an e-portfolio for that particular program and I actually used that screen, a screencasting option when we had to do a uh, annotated bibliography. So I screencasted myself just scrolling through the, the journal article and, and talking around that. So but yeah, I would agree, screencasting is a great, a great option. Yes, a lot of our students use screencast o -matic. Some of them use Jing, but actually with, with some of them now with, with the good versions of PowerPoint, they're actually just doing narrated PowerPoints. The only thing we found with narrated PowerPoints if you don't convert them to a video, you just send them with the file. They're absolutely massive. Um, so, but or, or even the Zoom suggestion, screen share and Zoom. Yeah, you can screen yeah. share in Zoom. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, you know, our students have full Zoom accounts, but even the the the, the free account is was powerful enough. Okay, yeah. so last call for questions or comments, and uh, we shall just wrap up and let you go. And thank you for your engagement. Anyone got any last burning questions? Oh, just, uh, Corinne was just saying they use Panopto, so they must have lots of money in Liverpool. <laughs> and Aurelie was saying, yeah, there's some browser. One, one I like is Awesome Screenshot. I think that's that the one a, I use to Yeah. Do, whether it's, it's awesome. screenshot or screencast and yeah. look over a short amount. So, especially for me for supporting staff, but you know, going over a short um, mini video of something is really useful. Yeah, it's very nice. And, um, 
I suppose we should thank our wonderful speakers, Lisa, as well. We're going to get there. Um, absolutely. So, yes, before we go even any further, thank you, Teresa, and thank you, Orly, for those wonderfully insightful and practical um, segments and, and thoughts on ePortfolio as uh, assessment and as an alternative assessment in these in these dark times, as I heard somebody refer to it yesterday. Um, but uh, just to, to shed some some lighter uh, lighter color on those dark times uh, from uh, within a, a DCU perspective, we've certainly had a, a lecturer who describes e-portfolios and correcting e-portfolios as giving him joy. So in the dark times, give yourself some joy um, as opposed to um, myriad different essay based uh, assessments, you can look at a more innovative, creative, flexible, student-centered style assessment. But look, um, everyone has, has given some wonderful inputs here, all of you today, together today. There is no magic bullet. Um, this is very hard, what we're, what we're going through at the moment. And what we've just presented to you um, is just some suggestions around how ePortfolio might be that alternative assessment. That, that you are looking for. And hopefully at the end of uh, Orly's uh, session, you now have a better, a, 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 at least a, an outline or a, some basic structures that you may work um, more closely and more forward on. So thank you to everybody for your engagement. We've had your questions, <laughs> though we're always open to those. Um, I'm gonna ask you now um, to, if you can take a moment, I'm just going to pop this into the chat box. And if you want to take a moment and just for the purposes of the national forum, they're looking for your feedback. So the link is there if you want to take a moment now. Uh, we are number 77, just to save you scrolling through the very long list of national forum uh, seminars that have been ongoing this year. Um, so while you're having a quick look at that, just to say that you will always find us on uh, our ePortfolio Ireland um, online home. And as Orna said there, yes, we will ensure that this video does go up onto the site, along with many, many other resources and recordings from other sessions that we have done and other resources that uh, collectively as a community uh, ePortfolio Ireland has, has created. So, um, Orna, Tom, do you want to jump in there and say your say anything at this point before we say goodbye? No, just to say, first of all, thanks very much to, to Arlie and 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 Teresa. Um, it's brilliant to get get a, a, a lovely oversight. But also, I mean, the amount of people who've been joining in because I think as I said, like these seminars. I mean, today has really been a sort of community coming together. Yes, we have the 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 two main speakers, but they've been very gracious and very generous and bringing everybody in so it's everybody talking with not being talked at so I think it's really they really captured that spirit and everybody well done for getting involved. Gosh Tom I can't follow that with any more words of wisdom <laughs> you've, st you've stolen all them but but just thanks to everyone for coming along um, as Tom said we're a very open community and we love people getting involved and if you'd like to be more involved in ePortfolio Ireland we'd be delighted to have you Um, so thanks and goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks all. Take Thank care. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, if people just want to use the old clap hands, it's a uh, nice before we go just to say goodbye. And... Oh, yeah. <laughs>